Uh, thank you very much. Okay, got it, got it. Hope everyone can hear me. Uh, thank you very much for the nice introduction. I'm very, very happy to be here and to be able to tell you a little bit about our work in the Knife Lab. So the Knife Lab for the Nature Inspired Fluids and Elasticity uh, Lab. Let me, yeah. And so uh, today I'm going to share a little bit with you like what we do. Uh, so as the name of the lab indicates, we love to study couplings between fluids and elasticity uh, either in artificial systems. So here you have um, time lapse of a hydrogel that was uh, originally spherical, put inside a packing of glass beads and that was confined. Then when it was uh, swelling inside the, the solvent, it was swelling inside the pores of the solvent. And when you take it out, it has this beautiful raspberry shape. And then as time uh, passes, it relaxes towards this uh, spherical shape. And so this shows how the, the solvent inside the gel can uh, move through the elastic matrix of the gel uh, to equilibrate, basically. So these kind of couplings are very interesting to, to us. And the other aspect of our lab is to look at um, uh, barrical um, objects, especially, specifically uh, inspired by plants. Like plants to us are fascinating. They can do everything we can do. They can uh, drink or eat. Uh, they can feel without having a nervous system. They can fight back predators without having muscles. Uh, and they are sessile as well, so it's even harder. And they can even speak to other plants or to insects without having a mouth nor ears. So it's, it's very like, fascinating to see how they can do all of these things that we can do, but using very, very different mechanisms to do so. And today I'm going to try to show you that Part of these mechanisms, they are uh, not from uh, purely biological uh, origins, but can actually be like, solely encoded in physical uh, mechanisms, like physical arguments. And I'm going to try to um, show you how uh, us, like chemical engineers, can speak with like, biologists to really uh, understand these mechanisms better to tackle two goals. One is to have a deeper contextual understanding of plant biology. But the other goal is how a uh, chemical engineer, like as, as in terms of engineering, how we can uh, make like, use these tools uh, to address some societal uh, challenges. And uh, but before that, I'm going to tell you, uh, like to show you like, three examples that I find fascinating, and then uh, we'll go um, more towards the presentation uh, about like real stuff that uh, we, we did. So uh, the first, yeah. If you want, you can take off your mask. Oh, okay, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, I wanted to show you this first picture here. So here you see you have a Venus flytrap, um, and you have a, a mosquito inside this trap, and you have three little hairs that maybe you can see here. And when you touch one time one hair, nothing happens. But when you touch a hair a second time, then the trap is triggered, and the mosquito is gone. And this, to me, illustrates like a lot of beautiful, um, like fascinating features about plants, so that first they can feel what is happening around them but they don't have like a, a, a nervous system. So how can they feel like mechanical strain and, uh, and react to it? And plus like they can move very, very fast, right? But they don't have muscles. So how can they move without muscles? So all these things to me are, are very, very interesting. And you, if we understand better how they can do that, then we can use it for like a lot of applications in mechanical sensing. So for soft robotics, for example, is a, is a big issue of soft robotics is how to, to impart mechanical sensing abilities to, to, to robots. The other aspects, that I like to, to look at into plants is, um, we can see it in this beautiful picture. So actually I went, I went there like to uh, Kenya and Tanzania, it's, it's gorgeous, so you should go if you can. Um, and um, here you can see an acacia tree. It's very typical in these uh, pictures with uh, deadly predators close to it, these giraffes. And these giraffes, they, uh, they're going to eat the leaf of the acacia tree. And when I was there, I, I looked at that and I was very surprised because the giraffes will eat a little bit the leaves of the tree and then they will move to another tree. And I was very confused because like, my mom always taught me, like, you need to finish your plate. So why are they just like, you know, sampling different trees? And it turns out, actually, when I looked more into it, is that when these uh, giraffes start to eat the leaves of the tree, then uh, the tree starts to produce some chemicals that are deadly for the giraffes. The giraffes have first to eat the leaves of the tree uh, and then to move very fast on the tree. And they have to go upwind because these chemicals can be spread in the air, and so the, the downwind trees will know that giraffes are nearby. So it's a very interesting mechanism that shows how plants can actually control their chemical production very uh, fast and to like transport it within their um, vasculature, within the, themselves, and transmit this information to nearby um, trees. 
And the last example that I found very interesting is uh, illustrated by this picture of these forests. Um, and uh, in a forest, people often speak about competition between different uh, plants and trees, and they want the more sun, so they fight each other. But actually, in the forest, you not only have competition, but sometimes you have collaboration, partnership, and even perhaps selflessness. And this, all these collaborations occur in the underground, like where you cannot see it. There are so many routes that are all interconnected, and they exchange yes. information very, very well. It's so well connected that some people speak about the wood wide web, just to, to, to make a pile with the internet. And for example, if you have a fire at one end of the forest, uh, then the plants that are burning are going to send uh, signals to their plants say, hey, something's happening, store more water so we can prevent the spread of whatever is there. So, so th this shows like uh, what is happening in this underground um, in terms of like water transport or chemical transport and interactions can be like, uh, um, first we should understand it better like to have like better like yields in agriculture, but it can be also like very interesting for like city planning or, or recovery or how you can basically transmit information in the underground. Um, so yeah, so uh, to storing water doesn't stop the fire, right? No, but it, it limits its spread. Like because if you have a lot of, if it's a, a very very wet plant, then it's way harder to it needs to dry before it can burn, right? So so it limits like the speed, exactly. And then you can have more wind or some that can help, or we can help. Like it's just like it's it's a buff yeah yeah exactly. Um, and uh, so yeah, so our research uh, is um, in four uh, areas, I say so more focused on plants, on where we work with real plant material, uh, on fluid mechanics, uh, on elasticity and soft matter, so many hydrogels. And today I'm going to show you like three examples that illustrate very well what we're doing, uh, one in almost each of them. And I'm going to show you like the related publications and the work we, we did uh, in each of these uh, topics. So uh, before we start, I wanted to us to have like um, uh, the same language and the same definitions. I'm just going to do a quick overview of how water transport occurs in the plants. So you, uh, you have water in the soil that is absorbed through the roots. Then it flows through channels called xylem, which are dead channels, it's dead cells, it's just like pipes basically. And it goes uh, all the way up to the leaves where evaporation occurs. And the pressure inside the xylem is negative. It can be up to minus six bars. So if it's very dry, then you can have cavitation events. So the water there is metastable which is very interesting because uh, plants really live at the edge of like uh, death, basically, because uh, if something bad happens, like everything can cavitate and they die. So it's very interesting to see how they survive here. And uh, then in the leaves of so photosynthesis occurs, the so sugar is being produced, and then this sugar is then being pushed back in other channels called phloem, uh, where here the pressure is positive and it goes everywhere to like feed the, the cells. And um, we uh, can harvest the sap from the xylem very well, but from the frame, we really cannot, it's very hard. So we'll see that a bit later uh, in the presentation. So uh, first, we're going to focus on the xylem. And um, then we speak about the phloem. And so this is like what I was doing during my PhD uh, on, on the, the, the xylem. So what I wanted to talk to you about first is uh, the ability of plants to uh, feel mechanical perturbations. So here on the left, you have a picture uh, of a plant called Arabidopsis thaliana. So that's the model plants uh, in plant biology. And the individuals on the left are untreated uh, plants, and the ones on the right have been touched twice daily. They just touch with, with, with like your hand or whatever. And you can clearly see that the ones on the right grew a lot less high than the ones on the left. At a bigger scale, at the scale of a whole crop, you have here a beautiful picture of an alfalfa crop, where you have, uh, in the middle of this crop, they put a, a grid, and the plants are put inside the grid, right? Uh, so wind can flow through them, but they cannot bend. And you can see that big, thanks to this grid, they were able to grow a lot higher than the surrounding uh, plants. And so this response of plants to mechanical perturbation is uh, referred as tigmomorphogenesis, right? So these experiments are like with multiple individuals, but we can also do like a similar experiment with one individual. So that's what has been doing here with the tomato stem. And the idea was, um, here I have the tomato stem. You have the growing zone on the tip of the stem. You can put a displacement sensor on the tip of the stem and record growth versus time. And uh, at the bottom of the stem, uh, while the top was being held, uh, people just uh, applied a transient bending. We can see here on the right of uh, this side, you have the height versus time. And you have the dashed line is just like um, 
a witness in the individual, so it was left untreated, and the plane line is the, the plane that has been bent. And you can see that when the, the, the stem is bent, then growth stops almost immediately, like within like a minute or two, uh, that this stops of growth lasts for like about two hours uh, or a bit more, and then it slightly, slightly recovers, and actually it will take more than eight hours to recover to a similar growth rate than, uh, than initially. And so it suggests many things. Um, first, it suggests that there is a signal that goes from the solicited area that control, uh, to the area that controls growth. But what kind of signal can it be, right? We know it's very fast, so there are a few hypotheses. So first, it could be uh, a signal produced, like when you bend it, maybe you have chemicals produced locally here, and then they could be advocated by the sap all the way to the tip of the, of the plants. But uh, the sap is very slow. And uh, it would take like 10 minutes, for example, to go all the way to the top, and it would not explain like for such uh, stops, uh, fast uh, growth stops. Just on that. Then it could be electrical signals. Like in plants, we know like the Venus flytrap, for example, you have a lot of electrical signals. But these signals only propagate to the phloem that I mentioned to you, that is the living tissues. So what we did, we burnt the middle of the stem here, and we did see the bending, and we still saw the stop of growth. So it means uh, it's not this uh, explanation. And the last explanation is for us physicists, well, like, what is a plant? Well, very naively, a plant is an elastic medium full of water, like a wet sponge. And when you squeeze a wet, wet sponge, you have motion of water. So that's what we were looking to investigate, if the origin of the signal was just a purely physical mechanism. And uh, the first evidence of such a response were given uh, in 2014 when I started my PhD, where basically you have here a tomato stem again, and uh, people put two pressure sensors at the bottom and the top of the stem, and then they bent the middle of the stem. And here on the right, you can see the response of these pressure sensors, and you can see that upon bending, the pressure increases very fastly, very fast, in both location, right, uh, and then decays very fast. So this was very interesting. Uh, to try to understand this, we decided uh, to do like a, a first a little modeling, and naively, when you think of a, a beam, I don't know if you remember your classes, uh, like in, during your bachelor, maybe you do. Uh, when you bend a beam, you have one part that is under uh, compression where the volume decreases, so it expels water, and you can see it here when you bend a stem, uh, you have some water that goes out. But the other part is under uh, tension, like it's under extension, and so the volume increases here. And so, but overall, at the linear order, uh, linear beam theory tells you that the total volume should not change. And so if the total volume should not change, then you should not see any overpressure. So how can we explain what we just saw? Is it uh, something that is purely biological? Like, what is the, the, the explanation? So to answer this question, we decided to do our own branch, that we, where we would control everything. So we took, like, this is a picture of a real uh, tree branch that is very complicated. Uh, wood is a highly anisotropic material. You have multiple scales, multiple channels. It's very complicated. So our first approximation of a tree branch is just like a cylindrical beam perforated with longitudinal channels and then we fill it with a Newtonian fluid. Or made of PDMS, so it's transparent, uh, elastic, and, and, and everything is very, very simple. And the first thing we did was try to bend this uh, artificial beam. And when we do that, we can see that open bending, we immediately see this increase of pressure that is uh, steady, and then goes back to zero, and we unbend the, the beam. And uh, I'm using this slide to define the bending strain, epsilon b, that I will talk uh, later, which is a curvature times the, the radius. And so we can see that bending actually generates another pressure. But uh, not only we see that, but we can see that actually, when we vary the bending strain, this overpressure varies quadratically with the bending strain, which was very surprising. So how can we explain that? Because I just told you we should not see anything, right? And so the explanation is that um, when you bend a porous material like this, it is energetically favorable for the material to bring all the parts that are far from its neutral axis closer to its center. And it's like when you take a, a, a straw and you bend it. Before it buckles, it becomes like a bit oval. That's what's happening here. But because you have a fluid inside it, it cannot squeeze the, the it cannot shrink, so it increases the pressure instead. So this argument here was found in Brazil like about 100 years ago, and he was able to link the relative uh, changement of volume of the channels to the bending strain, right, with a prefactor minus one half. And uh, now if we do like a thought experiment, so we, we can decompose our experiments actually in two steps. The first step is we have the beam that is closed, full of liquid. Then we open the, the beam, we bend it, right? And so we can see this, uh, like the Bazier effect, basically, where the volume changes. 
And then this uh, volume of water that went out, we can take it and inject it back. And when we do that, and then we close it. And then when we do that, we are going to involve a new property. We're going to increase the pressure, but we're going to involve the bulk modulus of the material. And this bulk modulus is the key parameter at play here. And then when you combine both this expression, we have a relationship between the overpressure that we measured with the, the bending strain and involving the bulk modulus and the prefactor one half. So now we're going to do experiments like to test uh, our theory. And basically what we see here is that we have this overpressure versus the bending strain and we varied uh, like the number of channels, the geometry of the channels as well, um, the Young's modulus of the PDMS and therefore the bulk modulus of, of the beam. Now you can see that we have always this quadratic response for all our beams. And when we normalize our overpressure by these key parameters, the bulk modulus, uh, we have this universal uh, scaling law where all our data collapse into a single curve. Um, and then the prefactor of this fitting uh, quadratic uh, curve is 0.6, which is very close to the one half projected using theory. So we are very happy to see that. Um, but now we can wonder like what we saw here in this uh, artificial system, is it true actually in trees, right? And so to answer this question, we use uh, three uh, type of trees. So the white poplar, the green oak and the pine tree. So this poplar is a bit different than the poplar that you see here in the Southeast. Uh, it's very common in France though. And we chose these three species because they had different um, vasculature systems. So uh, this white poplar uh, had a lot of channels of xylem that have a similar size and are uh, very uh, spread uh, evenly. Uh, then the green oak has very, very big channels that are very sparse. And then the pine tree actually has channels that are a bit different. They are called uh, tracheids, uh, and because it's a different uh, type of like tree, it's a gymnosperm. And it has a lot, a lot of very, very tiny channels. And so we did, we conducted our experiments uh, with all these branches. Yeah. That, what cross-sectional view is that? Yeah, so it's just like, uh, it's a cytologic cut. So it's, um, so you have the branch and you cut perpendicularly to the branch. And, uh, and so we, we connect our branches to uh, our pressure sensor on the water tank, and we close the, the, the end parts. So there's a, a lot of like methodology on how to do that to, because you don't want to have any air inside the branch when you cut it. And then we're going to use a motor here to bend the, the branch. And what we see actually is that indeed when we bend the branch, we have this overpressure that is steady uh, and goes almost to zero, uh, to zero. And when we vary this overpressure, uh, sorry, when we vary the bending strain, we can see that the overpressure also varies quadratically with the, the bending strain. So it was very encouraging to see that. Uh, now I told you like we need to measure the bulk modulus, which was the key parameter of our study. But this was never been done. So actually this part was the most challenging part of my PhD was how can we try to measure this bulk modulus? So I tried so many different things. What worked the best was to glue strain ga ga gauge on the, um, the, 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 the stem where you remove the bark uh, before. And uh, what we did is we uh, filled everything with water around uh, this uh, branch, and then we used compressed air to basically increase the pressure and using the strain gauge to measure the relative change of volume of the branch. And then using cytologic cuts, so you can see here, so there are also like a longitudinal um, cross-section. Then we were able to measure how many channels we had there, and they were able to link using the, the volume fraction, uh, we are able to know like how much uh, volume of channels uh, were there. And so we are able to find the bulk modulus of the channels, which we were looking for. And uh, now let's compare like both our systems because we have like data on both. And when we do that, we can see here the overpressure versus the bending strain for our three branches that have a very high uh, Young's modulus of about gigapascal and our artificial branches that are well softer, like it's about one megapascal. So you have a big difference in terms of pressure response because of that. But when you normalize this overpressure by the bulk modulus, you can see that all our data, both on natural system and artificial system, collapse into a single curve. So you've seen that this is like a, a purely physical mechanism that is like encoded purely on the geometry and the mechanical property of the branch. There is no biology involved here, right? And so what I want you to take back from this first part of the talk is that plants can feel and respond to mechanical perturbations, uh, that they use pressure actually instead of using vascular, uh, instead of using an system, um, and that what controls this uh, pressure pulse is the bulk modulus of the material, and that we are able to develop a theory that explains uh, the origin of this uh, overpressure in both biomimetic and natural tree branches. And so if you want to read more about this, you can read our paper like uh, this. 
five years ago. Um, Do you think animals also use pressure to convey information like bending? So yes and no. I think the first step of feeling something is in it pressure because you eh, actually I don't know because the when you squeeze something then um, no actually I'm not sure it's a very good question okay I should think more about that yeah because the the way I was uh, picturing it uh, how to apply this to like soft robotics for example is to use like a pressure pulse like for sensing would, would be nice. But uh, I think because of our nervous system, like um, our brains read ions basically, and so the nerves transmit ions, and so they, it, it, it doesn't need to use pressure for that. So maybe like more in terms of like interesting biology, like uh, cells, like cancerous cells, they use pressure to, to move or stuff like that. But like completed organisms like us, I think just like a nervous system works better for, for, for that. Okay, but the, so the second part of the talk is a link on uh, pore elasticity uh, as well. And so here the goal was to try to make a biomimetic aphid. So an aphid is like this tiny insect that goes and uh, drinks sugar from the phloem of leaves. And actually uh, this insect is way smarter than us because no one in the world has been able to extract phloem sap. It's too hard because the plants love it. It's like a very precious resource for the plants. And so it really wants to protect it as well as it can. Uh, but this aphid can harvest this, this sap. And so some people tried to, to make biomimetic aphids. One way was to try to have the aphid uh, on the leaf, and then you put uh, a little tank uh, around it to uh, constrain its deplacement. And then they had a laser, and when the aphid started to drink with the laser, they would uh, cut, like behave the, the, the aphid and try to see if they could extract some sugar, but they could not. So our idea here was to try to use a similar technique to try to poke like um, a phloem uh, channel uh, to try to see can you harvest this, uh, this sap. So to do that, uh, we had uh, uh, this setup here where you had like here a willow tree. Then we have the leaf that is upside down. Uh, and then we have like platforms and the, uh, a microscope here. And the idea is that uh, in, in, a, in a leaf, this is also like a cross section of the, of the mid vein of the leaf. Um, depending on the species, the location of the frame can change, but it's always like proportional. So it's always located at 60%, for example, for this uh, willow tree, for the species a bit more. But so by doing a few cytologic cuts, we were able to know where we should cut to find this phloem. Then using our micro platform and our microcontrollers and a razor blade, we were able to cut uh, there and to uh, then try to poke uh, one of the channels. So this is what we did here. So here you can see a little uh, droplet that is going to prevent the wound response of the plant. And uh, then you have the razor blade. We are going to the good location. And then I'm going to move and then cut a thin slice of this, uh, this mid vein to be able to access the, the phloem. So here we cut. Okay, and then uh, what you can see here, we made a micro needle, so we have the scale is very, very tiny. And uh, we are going to poke one of these phloem elements here to try to harvest the sugar. And we are able to harvest a little bit, but look at this volume, it's very, very tiny. And then uh, as soon as we are able to uh, absorb it, then the, the flow stops. So this is not enough to, to, to do like measurement on that. So we need to harvest more. So why, why is the flow stopping? That was something that was very curious about it. Um, and more than that, like, oh, sorry, let me go back. More than that, you can see when I poke it, if you look at what is happening here, you can see that um, there is a like, motion, like whatever that is, like, something is like changing its direction. It was a bit weird. So I was like, oh, what is that? So this is called a sieve plate, and it looks like that here. And so it's a very porous membrane that basically separates two elements uh, inside the, the phloem. And I was very interested uh, in this sieve plate because like, the, I was wondering, like, when I poke the, the flow, I'm like, this, this is bending, but can it affect the flow? And then I look at this uh, structure in, in like plants and fungi, and I was wondering, oh, is it like something that is like universal? Like, can you find it not only in the phloem, but in other parts of the plants? And the re response is yes. Like, you can find it here in the xylem with the entire cell pit membrane. You can find here, uh, this is a uh, septal pore in fungi, where you have here the, the one hole, and also like in cells like with a simple plasmodes matter in, in plants. And um, so I was wondering like how basically um, this bending can affect the flow and just does it affect the flow? So to answer this question, uh, I did a similar experiment that we did uh, a few years ago, where basically uh, I designed a, a block, it is transparent, I put a membrane in the middle of, between these two blocks, 
uh, where I could control the thickness, the diameter of the hole, the diameter of the membrane, the modulus, and everything. It is very simple, very transparent, so we could see everything and control everything. And then I inject the fluid and, and control the pressure as well. And uh, now I have a question for you, for the room. <laughs> so when I increase the pressure, um, what do you think will happen to the membrane, to the hole inside the membrane? Like, so basically I have the pressure that is higher here, and then you have a flow that will go from top to bottom. And do you think the hole in the membrane, will it increase, decrease, or stay constant? So you're going to do like a, a, a poll and, and voting with raising your hands. So who thinks the hole is going to increase its diameter? One, two, three, four. Explain that. So here I am injecting a liquid, um, and then I have this uh, membrane with a hole in the middle. Here, it's a circular membrane. And the question is, when I increase the pressure here, and so to induce a flow, what will happen to the hole here? Will it stay constant? Will it uh, uh, increase its diameter? Will it shrink? Like what the membrane will do and what will be the effect on the hole? So what do you think it will do? <laughs> I'm sorry, putting on the spot. Is, it, is, it, uh, is the plant alive and dead? I'm guessing it'll do different things, like actually respond. Um, I'm also thinking it's a trick question, so I think decrease. It's a trick question, indeed. Well, so that. Decrease, okay. Okay, someone says constant or not? No, okay, so actually everyone is right. You're all right, it increases or decreases. So it depends on the geometry of the, of the membrane. So depending on the pressure that you apply, and depending on if you have a thick or thin membrane, the hole can shrink or actually expand. And I'm going to explain that. So basically, uh, you can see here, like when you take a thick membrane, uh, it originally at the beginning, that the, um, the pressure will induce like the bending, in quotation marks, of the, the membrane. And as the pressure increases, it will go towards the stretching regime where the hole will expand more. And so this will have an effect on the flow. When the membrane is bending, then you will have a sublinear relationship between the flow and the pressure, and you have a superlinear relationship when the hole is opening, right? And so let's do our experiment, and indeed, this is what we observe. So with a thick membrane, we can see that indeed that we increase the pressure, the flow varies sublinearly, and with a thin membrane, it's deposited very superlinearly. Right? Um, and we can do a bit more than that. We can actually uh, quantify the strain in the hole and in the membrane. And so here we uh, measured the radius of the hole for different pressure, with P being the characteristic pressure in our system. So it's just the Young's modulus times the thickness of the power 4 divided by the radius of the power 4 of the, of the membrane. We can see that uh, in red, so all the points here are uh, data points, and all the lines are um, our theoretical predictions without three parameters. And you can see that uh, uh, when you have a thick membrane here of 6.7 millimeters, then the radius of the hole is shrinking, reducing. And then we go inside this intermediate regime here, it is between 5 and 10 of the P over P, which is given by another paper where they, they were looking at the, 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 the bending of membranes. And you can see that after that, like, it goes up back. So really you have the bending and then stretching. And then if you have a thin membrane, you only have these stretching parts, right? And you can see that the radius can really go like the, the, the radius like two times higher than what it is originally. And then we can uh, compare all of mem our membranes that have different thickness by plotting the strain times the radius or the thickness square. And you can see you have this beautiful curve where basically you can see like this bending regime where the hole is shrinking. Then we go in this intermediate regime where it's going back up and then it goes into, into this stretching regime where it's just increasing a lot, right? But what matters to us the most is actually the relationship with the flow. So if we assume a Poiseuille flow, then we can inject the, the equation we have for the radius inside this hydraulic resistance uh, in both the bending and stretching regime. And you can see that uh, you're in the bending regime, the, res the hydraulic resistance is increasing. Uh, and here um, you can see the same thing. And note that the white points, like they go down after the, when you get out of this intermediate regime. And then for the uh, switching regime, like the hydraulic resistance decreases a lot. This was actually not trivial because you could think that if you have, in the bending regime, you have one part of the membrane where the hole shrinks, but the other part of the hole actually is expanding. So naively you could think, oh, maybe they compensate, compensate each other. But actually, no, they don't. Like clearly, uh, they, they really don't. And so what was uh, powerful, I think, about this study is that we were showing that a hole inside an elastic membrane can have two types of behavior. And this is true not only for cells, but it's true for any any um, like system that has this just architecture. 
And so what it means is that uh, using purely mechanical arguments, uh, biology can control the flow by either increasing or decreasing the, the, the flow rate in between uh, two uh, compartments, right? So you have these two like, regime, the bending mode here and this switching mode. And uh, what I want you to take back from this uh, part of the presentation is that first we can see these poroelastic membranes everywhere in biology, right? That small deformation constricts the pore, while large deformation really stretches the pore, and that this pore size modification really changes drastically the flow. And that uh, here, uh, it means that biology can use only like physical arguments to control finally what is the, the flow uh, inside the, these channels. And, and the idea that later on to be able to leverage these abilities for like chemical engineering, to be able, for example, to have like passive control of like mixing or, or stuff like that. And you can read more about the study in this paper here. And uh, lastly, the, the third part is about hydrogels. That was what I was doing with the data at Princeton. And um, I told you a lot about the trees, right? But now I want to focus more on what happens in the soil. So uh, recently, hydrogels have been used as water reservoirs in the soil. And basically what it means is that when it rains, they will swell, store the water, and then in terms of drought, they can release the water, right? So the plants can survive uh, better and have like more yields and so on. And it works. Like uh, this kind of water reservoir technique works very well. You can see here, for example, for broccoli, uh, you, we are able to have 34 more percent of yields with less water. For lettuce, we had like 76 percent more with the same amount of water. And tomatoes, 45 percent more with less water as well. So it's, it's very good, it's very promising. However, it doesn't work all the time. Sometimes actually it's very bad and it's actually detrimental for the, the, the yields. And, and why was still like a, a conundrum we didn't know at all. And uh, interestingly, um, some recent experiments have shown that when you put a hydrogel inside a, a soil, um, the, it swells a lot less. Even though if the load that you apply is just like one, two or three centimeters of soil depth. So just a little bit has a, uh, of, of pressure on, on the, the gel has a huge effect on its swelling ability, right? So let's try to understand that. To try to understand that, we design our own artificial, artificial soil. So here you have a pack of glass beads, right? And in the middle, you have a, a hydrogel. And by using uh, an index match solvent, we, should, we will be able to observe the swelling of this hydrogel. Then we can apply on top like um, a load and we can vary how much pressure we want to apply to vary like how deep we put the gel. What you can see here, you have a, a gel that is swelling uh, with almost no loads. And you can see that it stays, uh, like the security stays constant, like it's uh, still a sphere. And it swells a lot by uh, about four times its original size. And when you apply a huge load of 22 kilopascal, you can see here that the shape changes a lot. It's not circular anymore. And it swells a lot less, like by, by about half. And uh, we can change the, the applied load. Uh, and the bit radius, and what we can see here is, sorry, is the um, volume change as a function of the, the load for different bit radii. We can see that basically when you have no load, it was a lot, but then uh, as soon as you uh, add some load, it decreases very, very fast, and still being about constant uh, at very, very high load after 20 kilopascal. And it seems that the bit radii don't have a huge effect on, on this. So let's try to understand what's happening. When you have the swing of a hydrogel, what parameters uh, matter? So you have uh, two effects that matters. Um, the swelling pressure is given by pi mix, which is um, basically how much does the gel love the solvent, and pi L, which is how much the polymer chains that make up the gel are being stretched. And so pi mix will uh, decrease as the gel is getting more and more swollen, right? This is the osmotic pressure. And uh, pi L uh, instead will increase the more the, the polymer chains are being stretched uh, in increases. And equilibrium will be a rich where, oh, I don't want to shut down. Uh, yeah. And uh, equilibrium will be uh, rich when both these quantities compensate each other, right? And you can see here, like you have the equation, and here you have the parameter that says what is what. And um, so now if you add a pressure on top of it, you have this swelling force that is uh, fighting something else. It's fighting this confining force that is basically uh, this uh, apply pressure, sigma, times the, the area of uh, one bead, so RB square. And the force that the gel uh, exerts on one bead is given by uh, this swelling force, swelling pressure, 
times the contact area between the gel and the bead. And this contact area, A, is given by contact mechanic uh, here. And uh, basically, um, it, is, it involves like the, the radius of the beads, the radius of the, the gel initially, so the inner radius, like here, and uh, the stress and, and, and the energy modulus and so on. And uh, at equilibrium, basically now that you have this uh, new uh, confining force, then uh, it will uh, basically uh, inhibit the swelling, right? And so because of this confining force, swelling is reached, like the equilibrium is reached way, way faster. And uh, using the equation I showed you before, we can make a model to explain that. And when we make this model, we can see that we are able to uh, predict very well what is uh, happening in our experiments. And here you can see two sets of blue and purple curves. So uh, blue and purple because uh, we run the simulations with different uh, bead radii, like the, the, the extrema. And then uh, you have two sets of them because we varied the initial radius of the gel by 10%. Because when we bought our gels, you had about a 10% difference in terms of the, 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 the size of the, the gel initially. And so, and so, of course, it swells uh, differently. And we can see what is cool about this model is that not only it captures the, like the physics, what is happening, but with this 10% uh, dispersity, it also captures the, the dispersity of the points here as well. So that was very convincing to us. Um, and then we compared our model to real soil experiments. So here we plotted the swelling force versus the confining force, right? So they should balance each other, right? So there, it's a straight line. And so all our data here are the, the points uh, in colors. And then we took uh, experiments done by people on real gel, like in soil, like in real soil, and we used their parameters and applied our model to what they were using. And we saw that uh, we were able, like all the data points uh, collapsed very, very well in our prediction. So it means that our model works for our uh, toy uh, experiments in the lab, but can also explain what is happening in real soil. And uh, so I told you a lot about the point of view of the gel with the swelling and the confining force, but what I didn't tell you about is what happened to the matrix around it, because as the gel is swelling, uh, it's inducing the motion of the matrix, and the matrix can reorganize itself as well. And to do that, we did two experiments here, where uh, we uh, put like, um, uh, colored beads here in black, and you have the gel uh, here in uh, green and here in orange in the middle. And uh, then we will we use these as stressors to be able to see how much does the matrix organize. And so here you have a very little load and here a very high load. And you can see that with a small load, like the matrix like, is changing a lot. So basically the gel is pushing a lot the beads, and we define the maximum displacement that we can measure as our parameters. And when you have a very strong load, you can see the matrix doesn't change at all. So we have almost no displacement. So we can track uh, the displacement as a function of time, right? And this maximum displacement, delta F after 100 hours, is our parameter. And you can see that um, this maximum displacement as a function of the load um, varies and, and like goes down very, very fast as soon as we uh, add a little bit of load and then goes down to uh, about being constant after like about 20 kilopascal, right? And uh, we can try to um, understanding better uh, by uh, doing a simple uh, force balance. So I showed you previously that the net force acting on the bead is this swelling force minus this confining force. That's the net force that the bead has to push beads around it. And then this force needs to overcome the interbit friction here uh, between like two different beads. And this uh, interbit friction is given by um, this equation here where you have the, the friction coefficient mu. And for motion to occur, it means that our net force needs to be bigger than this uh, friction force. And so we can define uh, a parameter, ns, that basically if this parameter is bigger than one, then we have uh, motion occurring, this dimensionless parameter. And uh, indeed, when we uh, plot our uh, displacement, uh, maximum displacement normalized by the radius of the gel initially, we can see that when, and versus our swelling number, ns that I showed you previously, we can see that when, uh, uh, we have less than one, we have no displacement, and more than one, clearly we have the matrix that can uh, rearrange itself. And so what I want you to take back from this um, part of the talk is that when confined halogels will uh, deform a lot more and swell a lot less, uh, that we are able to visualize um, uh, like the shape of a halogel inside a, a matrix and how much uh, the matrix is reorganizing itself. And we were also able to make a, a theory that explains 
uh, these observations and to uh, validate our theory, we're able to compare it to like real experiments done in real soil, which was very, very interesting. And uh, this can be used, of course, for like some engineering applications. And you can read more in our recent publications of uh, last year. And the, the bonus of these experiments was what I was showing you in the first slide, actually. Once you take the gel out of this matrix, then you have this raspberry shape that relaxes over time towards a spherical uh, shape. And this is very cool because you can use that to extract the diffusion poelastic coefficient. And this is something that is actually very hard to extract from spheres. People do it often on a thin uh, substrate, but not so much on spheres. Um, and so we're using a very, and they use like very expensive materials. So here using a very simple uh, and very cheap experiment, we're able to access to this um, poelastic poelastic time and therefore this diffusion poelastic coefficient. And you can also read about it in our recent paper. So yes, yeah, so um, with that, I hope I was able to tell you a little bit about what we like to do in our lab and to study all these couplings between fluids and elasticity uh, linked to how plants function or how we can use them to help plants in agriculture. And um, like this is like some of the people in my lab. So this is my postdoc Shankar, my three graduate students and my undergrads. And uh, with that, if you have any questions, I will be happy to, to answer them. Yes. What is the hydrogen Yeah, um, should I repeat the question? Go ahead. Yeah, so um, the question was, uh, what was the hydrogel made of? And if I could comment on the hydrogel that is produced by plant roots uh, inside the soil. And so the first, the first response is that it is uh, polyacrylamide hydrogel. Uh, but we could do that with other gels. It's just that what was here and, and easily accessible. And uh, indeed, like, so this hydrogel on the roots is called mucilage, right? And uh, I think it, it, I actually want to work on that a little bit as well. I think it's very interesting. And um, especially like uh, the, this, so this gel secreted by the, the roots really helps to harvest the, the water around it. But also you have like a lot of good bacteria that promotes growth and then fights the bad bacteria getting in. So, so I didn't work on it yet, but I'm very interested into it. Um, what, I, what I like a lot as well is that uh, some seeds, like chia seeds, when you put them in water, they produce this kind of like gel around themselves that is uh, thought to really help the, the growth of the seed. And um, there have been some experiments to make a hydrogel coating around these kind of seeds. Um, and people have seen that sometimes it was helping, sometimes it was not helping the seed at all. And why was is a bit unclear. Um, there were like, there is a recent paper in uh, Nature Food that I think you would like, where they were uh, basically showing that uh, they were using a new type of hydrogels to, to coat the seed. And they were putting a lot of good bacteria and, and water and so on. And they were able to see that it was really helping a lot to fight drought events. But, um, but at the same time, it provides a buffer zone. So basically, like in terms of responding to your environment, it can be a bit tricky because you have uh, the water needs to go to the gel and then to the seeds. So um, because, you know, like to germinate, seeds have to know, like it, it's incredible, like they all germinate at the same time, like very, very fast, right? And they have to know when is this optimal time. Right. And so having this hydrogel can alter a little bit this uh, notion of when to germinate, which can be interesting. So um, the honest answer is I don't know. <laughs> but the, the interesting answer is that uh, I think there are a lot of cool things happening with these gels. And that's actually one of uh, my research topics in my lab that I want to investigate more. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. How do we ask questions? Where's my... Raise my uh, hand. In animals, no, and, and also in, in the plants, you have this tube, no? I, I, I'm imagining some worms, no, like uh, the moths or, or nematodes or something like that. And when they are bending, they, they use this bending for jumping. So they are increasing in some way the, the pressure in, internally. For example, nematodes, they have an interstellar pressure, like a one atmosphere. Okay. They are like a uh, water balloon. Uh, but one one of, uh, of the difference with plants is the scale, no? These, these things are very tiny, like a one, one millimeter size, and, and the diameter is, is too tiny. Okay. So I don't know if the scale, because this deformation is interesting, I don't know if it's universal, if they are oval, like you said. If, if you are 
uh, doing in, in a balloon, it will become oval, no? In some way, if you increase the pressure, mm -hmm. and, and that can help to for these worms to jump. So I was wondering if this uh, depends on the scale, no? If you are small, 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 and the porosity there is not so much porosity, for example, in animal in these animals, no? It's more 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 or less water inside. So can we expect that this deformation happens at that those scales or, or no? Okay. That's the question. So the question is basically. Um, is this uh, modification in pressure due to uh, the bending of a beam, is it universal or scale dependent, right? Um, I think the response is that it's universal. Basically, like when you take a straw, which is like, like you know, like 10 inches, uh, and you bend it, before it buckles, you can see this uh, oval like being squeezed a little bit more. The xylem channels here are actually very tiny in the plants. Like they are like uh, microns, like tens of, or maybe hundreds max of microns. And so in this um, worm you were describing, I am assuming you can see it. Um, I don't know, because if it's very soft, maybe this modification in pressure is over pressure is maybe very tiny. Because you can see like it's, uh, the pressure is the bulk modulus times the relative change of the volume. So this relative change of the volume, you probably have it. But uh, if it's very soft, the bulk modulus will be like very, very low. And so this over pressure may be like very, very low. So I don't know if it's, uh, Physiologically relevant or not? Yeah, very it's very rigid, actually. Yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, th then you should see an overpressure. I, I think, like, I will bet, I will bet you do. So I, I don't know if it's easy to measure like a pressure inside it, but I'm guessing you you could measure it. And so if, the over, if you have something under pressure, then I'm guessing in terms of uh, stored elastic energy, it can be very um, very good for the the worm to do that. So it can jump and, and basically, if it can maybe like contract its muscles to bend. And then store this elastic energy there, and then when it releases, uh, re, uh, when it stops to contract the muscle, then you can just uh, release uh, all at once this elastic energy. And so actually, maybe a good way to actually be very fast because uh, it takes time to contract something, but when you just let it go, then the response can be very fast. So I, I don't know if they jump very fast or not, but yeah, they are using in, in some way the muscle, but also the hydrostatic side. Okay. So that's why the question because how much this hydrostatic pressure is helping to to increase the some uh, of the elastic energy, you know? I mean, you just yeah. take the equation. Uh, yeah, but that's why. I, I think it, 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 it could work, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think we should speak more. That's very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I think you have the question, yeah. Yeah, I've got a question uh, about the bug modulus when it's and then it does not. So can you remember that when the over pressure is normalized by the bug modulus, they overlap into one curve? So about this bug modulus, um, I I am currently working in Southern Yang Ho School, uh, working with hydrogel and animal biological samples. And um, so when we talk about the bug modulus, the um, a common assumption we make is the water molecule is itself incompressible. And also the solid phase is incompressible, but they combine um, the water can like go inside in out, like so okay. that change the volume of That's a very good question. So the question was, um, when you bend uh, a branch, basically, um, the water, uh, so, so the, the volume of the channels can be, um, the volume wants to shrink, but it cannot because there's a, a liquid there. But actually, can the liquid uh, go a little bit inside the matrix around it and then uh, change the, the effective bulk modulus, right? That's the question. And um, I think it's, I didn't think about that before, to be honest. I think it's a very, very good point. Um, so what we measured here was actually this effective bulk modulus, right? So if that happens, we kind of measure it. Like we, uh, in the way I was doing it, it's a macroscopic experiment. So I have no way of differentiate between two cases where you have this uh, internal like uh, motion of water molecules a little bit in the matrix or not. Um, maybe, so if I go back to uh, these slides, that's always the fun part when you have to click 100 times. Uh, So yeah, may maybe this could actually explain a little bit what we see here. So for example, uh, in our artificial system, uh, what, I, what was very interesting to me is that when you bend the, the beam, 
you see like the, the, the time between when you bend and when the pressure is steady is very short, right? It's less than a second, and it is given by the poor elastic time, right? But when you go on trees, and this actually varies a little bit between samples, uh, this time here is way longer, right? But the time here is super long, actually, right? And so maybe it explains that actually there is some motion of water indeed that is occurring there. Um, I was thinking so because like uh, uh, xylem, they have um, pores that are like on their walls as well for water transport, like laterally as well. So this can explain that. Uh, so actually, when you squeeze it, so I was squeezing it under water, so some of the water may go out a little bit, and then when I embed it, maybe it wants to get back in, but it takes time or it's not working so well, so it's not going back to zero. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's a very good, uh, very good uh, direction of, of research, and uh, I think you're probably right. Can I ask yes. a question from out here in the ether? <laughs> Can you hear me? Or not? I don't know. I don't know how this works from asking questions from outside. Can you hear me? Okay, so the question is why do plants that uh, feel something like a, a pressure or mechanical deformation, why do they grow smaller? So it's a very good question. Um, so basically, uh, plants can grow a given amount of mass, of biomass, right? And then, let's say within a day or a year or whatever, they, they produce a given amount of mass. And then they can allocate this mass to different parts. So they can say, oh, I want to grow taller to have more like sun. I want to have more leaves to be able to do more photosynthesis. Or I can grow more roots to have more water or better anchorage. Or I can go thicker to have a better resistance to like wind. And so what's happening here is that when you brush them, you're telling them, oh, be careful, you have like a very, very strong um, wind event. And so you could die and being taken away from the soil. But instead of growing higher, what they do is they grow thicker to resist bending of the wind better, and they grow more roots to be like better anchored. So they want to resist to this um, external stimuli to, to survive, basically. Um, what is also like very interesting, I think, is that if you touch them two times, you see this. But then if you touch, touch them every day, 20 times, you don't see anything, right? It's kind of funny, right? And what it means is, it, and it's normal, because like if you see outside and you see the plants that are, you have wind that occurs all the time. So what I just told you is that actually, if you have just a little bit of wind, they should stop growing, but they actually grow. So something is different. And so what is different is that if they have like uh, experienced this kind of bending and they are used to it, they're like, oh, okay, it's not too bad. Like, uh, I can survive with that, so I can keep growing, it's fine. But then if you have one extreme event that is a bit rare, and you're like, oh, something bad is happening, I need to be prepared for that. So th that's why you see this difference here. How do they, how do they know? Yeah. yeah, no, so the so question is like, how do plants know to do that? So that, that, that's, that, that's uh, to me, the beauty of it is that they don't, uh, think the way we do, but they can do like a lot of, of what we do uh, using like passive physical mechanisms, like from my point of view. And uh, so as I told you, like the idea is that, so if my, uh, I was showing you an example, like if um, you, you, you bend these parts, then you have a response like far from where you bend it. So here you have the, the growth response, right? And so it's just like physically, you have a pressure pulse that is produced. Right, and so this pressure pulse tells the cells here, something's happening. So basically the, the pressure pulse goes to the growing zone here. Uh, so you have water getting inside the, the cells here. So the cells then expand. This opens mechanosensitive channels that releases ions, right, that basically uh, inhibit growth, right? And the question is how can we differentiate one single event from a lot of uh, uh, small events? So the idea is that basically, depending on how um, big is this pressure pulse, so how big, how big is the strain? Like the, the response will change, and so the swelling of these cells will change, and they will probably release more or less ions. And my hunch, and I'm, we don't know about that, but my hunch is that there is kind of, kind of a threshold, like a function that says, oh, if it's just a little bit of ions, then I, I don't care, I don't respond to that. But if it's higher, then you have this uh, growth stop. That has a question. Um, has a question online. I don't know how to ask okay. it. Uh, who, who, who speaks? Uh, you want to so just your question? The... Uh, just a second. Uh, I don't know if you can see me. 
Uh, a good question. Like this was, I think, about 40 days, but I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah you, can, you can see it. You can see it. Oh, yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah. So yeah. Or, or, or no? I think a hard question. <laughs> so the question is, uh, what happens that with uh, plants that can naturally curl? Um, I don't know to be honest. Um, I'm guessing. So if you unbend something, you should have like a, a, a pressure change that is like physically like um, like you should put everything under tension. That's my hunch. Um, I think because these plants curl, they typically grow around stiffer plants and themselves never really bend, right? Because the, you're talking about the plants that grow like around something exactly. And so the, the, if the, the, the stem that they grow around it or the, the, the stick they grow around it, if it bends, they bend with it, right? But they don't bend that much. Like they still like, because uh, they're attached to the, to the stem itself. So they don't feel so much the wind around themselves. So I'm guessing this affects them a lot less than plants that stand like by themselves. All right, well, uh, we have one last question online. Uh, Jeanette Yen asks, redwoods transport water 300 feet. Can you make a biomimetic curtain that can transport um, that distance? So there is someone uh, called Jonathan Boreco at Virginia Tech who works on these kind of questions, actually. Um, so the answer is, I hope yes, okay. <laughs> but it's not done yet. Okay, oh, great. Is that Navier Stokes equation on your arm? Yes. You want to show it, everyone? <laughs> All right. yeah, it's, it's a long story. Uh, if, if I just have like two minutes. Uh, yeah, um, sure. Uh, no, yes, I tell my students that if they have a tattoo, then they can they can they can bring whatever they want. No, it's uh, it's actually I, I quit my bachelor when I was in the bachelor. I quit and I became a fireman. And um, then when I'm back, uh, I saw a documentary on TV about the saber-toothed tiger. And the question was like, paleontologists were wondering how, how did this saber-toothed tiger use to kill its prey? And uh, they asked help from biomechanicists to answer this question. So the biomechanicist took one tooth. The tooth was a bit curvy like this. It was very sharp inside, very, a very strong young modulus, like very strong stiff in this direction, but very weak in that direction. And nowadays, predators like lions, to kill their prey, they jump on the back of the prey, they bite it, they make it fall, and then they suffocate it. And so if the saber tooth tiger were doing that, it will bite the back of the prey, the prey will move, and then the tooth will break. So it can't do that. So instead, it was lying down and then jumping and cutting the, the throat, right? So I didn't care about this per se, but it made me realize you can do physics applied to biology, which I really love. So I went back to school, uh, did my last semester of my bachelor, and uh, we used actually Navier Stokes during this last semester, which I really, really loved. Then I did a master in mechanical engineering, but with a specialty in biomechanics. And I was looking at the flow of blood and, and also like in, the, um, in your brain. And so it was a lot of fluid mechanics and Navier Stokes again. And then I did my PhD with UL Forter on how plants can uh, move without muscles, basically, uh, on the, or, or feel. And it was also a lot of free mechanics, and I actually did a lot of Navy Stokes there as well. And I was like, okay, like when I got my PhD, Navy Stokes has been a big part of, of me since I went back to school, so I wanted to have it as literally a, a part of me. So that's why I made the, <laughs> the tattoo. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take a, a look.